A Denver mayoral candidate defends his ad showing people of color committing crimes, says black and Latino candidates who are criticizing it are just playing politics. Another mayoral candidate claimed that Denver's homeless want to live on the streets. The study he cited actually found the exact opposite. Whether Colorado should have higher penalties for possessing fentanyl is a debate that continues, even inside the minds of some people who voted for it. And answering your questions about what's happening to all the cash Colorado's collecting from our delivery fees tonight on Next. There has been another leak at the Suncor refinery, second one in a few weeks. Suncor says staff detected a vapor leak at one of the refinery's three plants in Commerce City this morning. Suncor did not say specifically what vapor is leaking, but Suncor said the company's own monitoring equipment showed that it is not a public health issue. Another leak was reported in January. Suncor said that one also was not a public health concern. Suncor is currently working to get all three of its plants back online by the end of March. They were shut down for what the company said was damage from cold weather. There were also two fires at Suncor right around that same time in December. Denver mayoral candidate Chris Hansen is dismissing calls to edit or take down his campaign ad that shows people of color committing crimes. Black and Latino candidates told Hansen during last night's debate on 9 News that the ad was offensive and that it perpetuates stereotypes. Hansen's campaign manager, Parker Butterworth, told us the criticism is just politics. Our Marshall Zellinger looks at that and some other key moments from the first televised debate. There is only one political ad on television right now for anyone running for Denver mayor. How did it come to this? The imagery in this ad paid for by Chris Hansen led to the most engagement between candidates, starting with Ian Tafoya. Raise your hand here on the stage if you're disgusted by an ad that makes people of color as the only criminals or the people who are overrepresented in homelessness. It is a trope that has been broken forever. The question to Hansen was to explain the choice of showing an ad with seven people of color who appear homeless and committing crimes. This is the number one issue on voters' minds. How do we improve public safety? How do we address the homelessness crisis? To, to have some accusation that somehow a, a racist ad, I think, is totally overwrought. Leslie Herod followed with another critique. You didn't see what we saw because you're not us. Yep. But you've got to put those blinders away. On the topic of homelessness, Kelly Bruff said she wants to provide temporary sanctioned housing for those experiencing homelessness. So what if they say no? As mayor, you still have an obligation to keep everyone safe. And so if somebody can't make that decision for themselves based on mental health or addiction issues, I still think we have an obligation as government to make it for them until they can. So I would still take them in. When asked what they would be arrested for, she said there is no camping in the city. Mike Johnston is one of four candidates joining Kwame Spearman, Trinidad Rodriguez, and Debbie Ortega, who wants to hire more police officers. There are currently 148 vacancies and just 70 cadets in the academy. The reason why we can recruit more is we do want to recruit them to a different kind of job than they've done so far. When, when people and I talk to people in communities, what they want are officers back who are visible, who are walking the streets, who are talking to community members, who are walking into businesses, giving them their cards, talking to neighbors, asking questions. They want real community-based policing where you can reform what currently feels like being policed and put back in what feels like being protected. Lisa Calderon would prefer to hire more city employees that do not wear a uniform and badge. It's interesting that we keep talking about hiring more police officers and we don't talk about hiring more social workers or librarians or people with expertise in intervention in violence. Thomas Wolf joined Kwame Spearman and Kelly Bruff in wanting to bring back qualified immunity for police officers and Wolf wants police misconduct settlements to be paid for out of the public safety budget. Of course we can't have uh, individual officers uh, on the hook for the liability that we create because we're not going to be able to attract any more officers. The way to solve that is to have the, the but that come out of the budget of safety overall so that they police themselves. I got seven of the 13 candidates in that two and a half minute piece. That's just a sample of the detail we heard in our two hour debate, which you can watch and I promise you, you will not be bored. We have a link on 9news.com and a full written recap of it. Denver voters, I, 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 I appeal to you. This can help you make an informed decision before ballots go out March 13th for the uh, election that's April 4th. I, I think it's interesting because folks who may not follow politics, you know, like us nerds do, might think, well, you know, everybody in the race probably got pretty similar ideas because, you know, they're all, you know, Democrats or progressives or whatever else. But I mean, 
you, what you heard on the stage last night from a number of those candidates was exactly what Colorado Republicans say should be done in the city of Denver. So really, no matter where somebody is on the ideologi ideological spectrum, they're going to find a candidate in this race. Right. And with 17 total candidates, there's just 13 of them, yep. the people who took money from the Fair Elections Fund. If you can't find the, per the one that you want, maybe you can start eliminating based on what you hear, what you don't like, and then that gets you closer to making a decision. You might be down to 11 people after that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Marshall, thank you. Mayoral candidate Kwame Spearman made a pretty prominent false claim in last night's debate when he said that a survey from a homeless advocacy group backed up his personal belief that the homeless are exploiting the system and that most of them want to stay on the streets. The group that actually did the survey pointed out that Spearman read the numbers wrong. We checked, and he did. The survey says the exact opposite, that the people experiencing homelessness who were surveyed overwhelmingly want homes. Because we are not enforcing our laws, we've become a magnet for people who are exploiting the system. Denver Homeless Out Loud, which is a far more progressive organization than I am, did a survey and said 52% of our unhoused would prefer to live in a tent than other housing options. They also said that 18% of our unhoused will only live in tents. That is not what the survey says. Spearman kept doubling down on it today, posting links to the survey that actually says the opposite. Denver Homeless Out Loud asked unhoused people in Denver to rank their preference of three housing options, a house, a tent, or a shelter. In that ranked choice system, it's the purple, it's the purple on the graph there. 91 of the 109 people surveyed, 83% said they want a house, they want a home. Only 18 people said that they would choose a tent. Living in a shelter was no one's first choice. Denver Homeless Out Loud founder Ben Dunning told us today that he thinks all the candidates could get a better grasp of the issue of homelessness if they actually talk to people experiencing it. It just shows a lack of understanding of what's actually happening on the ground. And a lot of that comes from, they're not talking to the homeless community, you know, they're creating the ideas inside their head and then trying to convince other people that they, that, that they know what's happening and that they have an idea what, that'll work. Late this afternoon, the Spearman campaign acknowledged he misinterpreted the statistics. Democratic Representative Leslie Harrod said last night that she and other state lawmakers got it wrong when they increased penalties for fentanyl possession last year. It was a bipartisan effort. Our new Roy asked Harrod why she's been on both sides of this issue, and it's a chance to take a deeper look at that policy that impacts all of Colorado. When we asked the mayoral candidates to raise their hand if they supported the change in law, making possession of one to four grams of a drug with fentanyl a felony, it stood out that Democratic Representative Leslie Harrod, who is running for Denver mayor, did not, since she voted in favor of the bill. Last year, I did support it because we were going back to felonization, going from zero, and we were able to bring that up to one. And then she said, however, as I'm looking at the statistics today, and I watched today, and yesterday, as Department of Corrections asked for more beds to fill with folks who are addicted without having enough providers to provide mental health services to those people, we were wrong. We didn't get it right. Oof. <sighs> that was a tough year last year. Lisa Rayville with Harm Reduction Action Center has been loudly against this bill and said her worries are now true. People are getting arrested. We've also seen some of the data coming out even in the first six months of folks getting arrested for felonization. We took a closer look at where Herod got her information from. If you look at the Joint Budget Committee report, you see the Department of Corrections is asking for more money to get more beds because of a dramatic rise in the prison population. There are a whole bunch of reasons listed, state population, how people are sentenced, parole policies, and a list of legislation that includes HB 22-1326. The law just went into effect. So even if someone had been charged with felony possession, that case would still be in its very early stages. Boulder County's Democratic District Attorney Michael Doherty, who helped craft the law, said that he hasn't noticed a spike in felony possession cases in his office. But for him, the important part was always having more tools to go after dealers. Is it frustrating or disappointing to see that somebody who had voted to make this law is now already saying, oh man, we made a mistake? No, I was heartened by how many legislators voted to support the law. It was just a few months ago. So today, Harris said that she doesn't really care how much of a factor the law is for her. If it's impacting the number of people ending up in prison in any capacity, that is a problem. Doherty said that a big part of the bill, too, is the millions that are being put into the harm reduction treatment centers, buying naloxone, all those programs. But at this point, it is just too early because there's all these measures, Kyle, to track the data, but we just don't have that data yet.
Yeah, I mean, I could see, I could see somebody looking at this and saying, well, she's just saying what she has to say now because she's running for Denver mayor. I mean, talk is cheap. Legislation is not. I mean, she's still in the legislature, could still bring a bill to do something if she wants to, but she'd need to be able to convince a majority. So what are they looking at in terms of legislation? Yeah, okay, so there is stuff that is being introduced now because they were realizing there were gaps in the original fentanyl law. So one of the things Lisa has talked about for months now is that people were getting scared to call 911 because they were afraid if you call during an overdose, and they show up and they find fentanyl, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get arrested. So now there's a bill that's being introduced to clarify what the Good Samaritan law is and expand it to include fentanyl so that people aren't worried about calling 911. And they said specifically they did it because they realized that was a problem coming out of that original fentanyl law. Now that we actually see it, see it in practice. Mm -hmm. We've seen a couple changes after we see what happens in practice with laws around fentanyl. Anusha, thank you. Cities in Colorado cannot experiment with rent control, even if they want to, because there's a statewide ban. Democrats who want to lift that ban are now making some major concessions. And what they're really trying to do here is win over the votes of fellow Democrats, because Republicans have such a tiny minority at the state capitol, they can't block anything on their own. Similar bills on this have failed and passed due to opposition from landlords and, honestly, Democrats who are worried about this, uh, like the potential of a veto from Democratic Governor Jared Polis. This week, one of the current bill sponsors, Democratic Representative Javier Mabry, introduced several amendments as a compromise. The new rent control proposal would allow rents to increase relative to inflation and would make exceptions for new developments. Again, stress, this would then be city by city. Cities would have to opt into doing this. Representative Mabry said he sees rent control as just one possible tool for municipalities to address rising housing costs. There's still the issue of the governor and a potential veto he says he's skeptical that rent control is actually going to create more affordable housing stock. When a home fire happens, first, of course, come the firefighters, the paramedics, and then come the Red Cross. And then, after a few days or a week, families are often left to fend for themselves, unless they're able to connect with a small nonprofit called Our Front Porch. Our Front Porch is there for the next steps in the process of recovering from a house fire. They take referrals directly from the Red Cross, and they're able to offer people personalized case management, navigating insurance claims, getting ready to rebuild, getting their rental deposit back, having trauma therapy after they survived a house fire. That's why they're this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign recipient. You scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me and a bunch of other people in donating. Since Wednesday, you've raised more than $10,000 to help those house fire survivors get back on their feet. Thank you. We're shelling out millions in additional delivery fees. Right, we're getting our first idea of where that money's going. And we got some blue ribbon good news for you. And my boy won some champion points. No matter what's in the news, nobody leaves here feeling down on a Friday. That's our hope. Next. Tonight's next question comes to us from a viewer named Jess. Jess asked for an update on how much money has been collected since the state started the 27 cent fee on all retail deliveries last year. And Jess was wondering where all that money is going. Great question, Jess. So the State Department of Revenue tells us that they've collected more than $33 million in delivery fees since last August. Roughly half of it came from my family's Amazon purchases. The funds go to a variety of state projects. They do not yet have a project by project dollar breakdown yet, but we know some broader categories. For instance, more than $800,000 of our delivery fees are going to go towards air pollution mitigation. I wonder where that 27 cents went to. Hey, this afternoon, it was glorious. All that sunshine temperatures warming up quite a bit, especially when you compare it to this time yesterday. We were still in the deep freeze, 27 degrees warmer at this hour than where we were uh, last night. Much of eastern Colorado looking at that nice warm up and even up in the high country too. Tonight, we do have mostly cloudy skies across the metro area, but it will be a dry evening, a calm evening for many of us as this ridge of high pressure kind of camps out over Colorado over the holiday weekend. You see the storm system well off to the Pacific Northwest. That will will make a line drive into the state Sunday and into Monday. So if you're up into the mountains, looks like some fresh powder on the way. In the meantime, you can just kind of see that cloud deck streaming in. Temperatures tonight falling into the teens and 20s here in the metro area. Some spots like Gunnison in the single digits tonight. High pressure is around and then here comes that area of low pressure. It digs in again Sunday and into Monday, but out ahead of it, these temperatures are going to be feeling pretty good. In fact, with partly sunny skies tomorrow, we'll be looking at daytime highs in the lower 50s here for the metro area. Still a bit cooler 
off to the eastern plains with some 30s up in the mountains. To break it all down in the seven day forecast, we'll be watching the winds ahead of this system, but really we won't see much in the way of impacts here in the metro area. No snow for us Sunday and into Monday like the mountains will see. We'll have to wait till Tuesday night into Wednesday. Right now it looks like a little bit of light snowfall coming through, but really we'll once again feel the cold making a comeback here to Colorado. We love sharing your good news each week. This edition is Best in Show. My good news is one of my dogs is getting the canine good season. All right, they can't all be Best in Show. We just want them to have fun. Next. We've been sharing your good news here every Friday for the last 338 weeks. That's 2300 weeks in dog weeks. So we went to the Colorado Kennel Club Dog Show with our favorite question. This is Colorado's best kept secret. It's a 122 year old event. It's been around since 1901. Hi. My good news is that I won second place at American Kennel Club for the first time of showing this dog. My good news is my mom didn't fall down today. She fell down twice yesterday and I'm worried about her all the time. My good news is that my husband started a brand new job this week on the 13th, and so we're super excited that he is now gainfully employed. Now, does it have anything to do with dogs? No. It, well, it supports the dogs. It keeps them in the lifestyle to which they've grown accustomed. My good news is one of my dogs is getting the canine good season, so I'm happy about that. My good news is that I have two excellent dogs that I'm so proud of. People said it was the most beautiful border collie he's ever seen, and that just brings so much joy to my heart. This afternoon, I'm going to let them in the pool and jump, and it's going to make my whole week. My good news is this. When I come home, and I've had a really tough day, I'm greeted by somebody that doesn't recognize my tough days, that greets me in the happiest form, and just totally changes my mood, just puts me in another place, makes me so glad that I'm partnered with my furry friend. They just make everything in life better. That is seriously like the truest thing that has ever been said on the show in six years. Man, I want a dog again. All right, your feedback next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is people enjoying one of our famous fake spring seasons in February. Kelly Clark, no relation, snapped a picture of somebody ready to enjoy all of the seasons in Colorado. Got that Miata cruising down six towards the mountains, top down, skis on back. And Courtney shared a picture of her daughter and friend soaking up the sun. They were all prepared for that. They got the towels and the umbrella, what appears to be uh, lemonade. Just, hey, ignore the snow, enjoy the sunshine and warmth. If you've got something that says Colorado to you, share it with us. Use the hashtag HeyNext or email next, 9news.com. Mark writes in tonight to say, what if Chris Hansen's campaign ad, the guy running for mayor, had showed only white people committing crimes in Denver? Would the other candidates still be outraged? And would white people find it offensive? Just curious. I'm glad you're just curious, Mark. Uh, I don't know. Is, is, there, is there a prevailing stereotype for the last, I don't know, couple hundred years that, that white people are particularly dangerous or prone to crime? Because if there was, I could see your point. So I don't. Casey writes, I turned to Channel 20 last night for the debate to take a look, and I found myself watching the whole thing. Well, that's kind of you because it was two hours long. Casey says, look forward to seeing the other two. That's right, because we're going to have another Denver mayoral debate on March 14th, and then another for the runoff. A text that came in that said there were a lot of questions that produced a waffle answer. Pin them down. Well, guess what? We're interviewing all 17 of the candidates coming up. Buckle up.